have you ever noticed that it's super easy to find advice on what you should do, but find information about what you shouldn't do? Well, that's a lot harder. When my mom was a kid, she told me a story that reminded me of this. She and her aunt both liked to bake, but my mom did it more often. So one day her sister came to her and she's like, Becky, why can't I bake brownies like you? Teach me how to bake brownies. So my mom got out the recipe, they ran through it, and then she left her in the kitchen to bake her brownies. They smelled great, they looked great, everybody gathered in the kitchen when it was time for the brownies to come out of the oven, but after the first bite, everybody was spitting it into the trash. Why? Well, she'd accidentally switched up the baking soda and the baking powder. Oh, she was mad. My mom says she got so up in her face and she was like, why didn't you tell me not to mix up the baking powder and the baking soda? My mom was like, well, I told you how to bake the brownies. I didn't know I was gonna have to tell you how not to bake the brownies too. Knowing what not to do is sometimes just as important as knowing what to do. So how does this apply to you as a freelance copywriting mama? Well, how about how you're showing up on sales calls? So you can find tons of downloadables and scripts for sales calls that tell you what you should do when talking to prospective clients. But what about what you shouldn't do on those sales calls? Who's telling you about the mistakes you should be avoiding? I am. In this video, I'm going to give you nine mistakes copywriters make on sales calls that can negatively impact your ability to land the client. Then I'll break down why these nine are such a big deal and what you can do instead to crush those sales calls and land more clients. This YouTube channel is full of actionable and proven hacks, tips, and strategies for freelance copywriting mamas just like you. Make sure you subscribe and smash that button so you get notified when my videos go live. Mistake number one is a biggie. Don't show up late. I get it. Things happen and I've been guilty of getting sucked into a project and losing track of time too, but it's important not to let that happen. First impressions are made right at the start. I mean, that's why they're called first impressions, right? Showing up late for a sales call is a red flag to that prospective client. When you show up late, you're giving them the idea that whatever else you have going on is more important than they are. They might feel disrespected as if you couldn't be bothered to even show up on time. And sometimes there's no coming back from this. There are things you can do to make sure that you show up on time so that doesn't happen to you though. So do this instead. When you know you have a book discovery call coming in, be vigilant. Put a reminder in your calendar and set up a couple of notifications. I often set one for the day before, the day of about an hour before the call, and the day of about five to 10 minutes before the call. That way there's no chance I'm gonna miss it. I also find it easier to keep appointments in the back of my mind when I let others in on my schedule for the day. For example, I like to give my husband a rundown of my schedule every morning. He helps hold me accountable for the calls that I have coming in, and he asks me how they go afterwards. Just saying it out loud that that is coming today helps put it in the front of my mind. It makes it easier to not forget. Mistake number two, not taking notes. Okay, so there's nothing worse than getting off a discovery call and sitting down to write the proposal only to realize you're not 100% sure exactly what they wanted because you neglected to write anything down. That, or maybe it's worse if you have to wing it and pray you get the proposal right, or breaking down and swallowing your pride and calling on that bump again to ask for clarification. So embarrassing. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I was guilty of this one when I first started my business. I did the old facepalm moment when I hung up more than once after realizing I hadn't written down a single word. Do this instead, okay? At the very least, keep a notepad at your desk so you can jot down notes as they share information with you on the call. If you're like me, you're a faster typer than you are a handwriter. So you could always bring up a Google Drive sheet or file that you can plug information into. It's great for quick note taking so that you can keep the call on course. When it comes to calls for onboarding clients, and you can do this for sales calls as well, you could also record the call on Zoom. That way you can rewatch it any time or have it transcribed for reference while you do research or create proposals. Just make sure that you ask the client for permission. Make sure it's okay that you record the call before actually doing it. Now, I'm not saying you don't have a good memory, but the reason why it's so important to take some notes is that you're not always gonna be able to sit down and create that proposal the minute you hang up. Sometimes you'll have back-to-back -back calls or you'll have other items scheduled for the rest of the day. By the next day, when you sit down to create the proposal, things are not gonna be as fresh in your mind. 
having taken some notes will ensure that you put yourself right back in that call and you're on the ball the minute you sit down to write that proposal. Mistake number three is not asking the right questions. So it's tempting to let the client take the lead on the discovery call. After all, they're the ones who scheduled it, right? And they're interviewing you. Well, yes and no. A good sales call should operate more like a joint interview where both parties ask and answer questions to ensure that working together will be a great fit. This is your business. You get to choose who you work with and who you don't. You're under no obligation to sign a client who's throwing up red flags all over the place on the sales call. That's why you need to make sure you're asking the right questions during the call so that you understand whether or not you're aligned with your values, working style, and communication style. So do this instead. Create a short list of questions you'd like answered before this call starts, okay? It's difficult to come up with questions on the fly. And if you don't have some ready, you'll be left stammering, uh, I, no, I, I don't have any other questions, thanks. Then you'll kick yourself later when you think of it. Mistake number four is not paying attention to the client's goals. As service providers, it's our job to serve the client. That means you need to know what their goals for their campaigns and their business as a whole are so you can create a workflow that supports them to the best of your ability. Now, I'm not saying you should exhaust yourself trying to reach unattainable goals just because that's what the client wants. The important thing is to go in with your eyes open so you can set up reasonable expectations with the client from the start. And that's impossible to know if you never ask them what their goals are. So do this instead, just ask. Ask them what their goals are on the discovery call. I like to frame it in benchmarks. This helps them put their goals into concrete numbers and make a doable plan to get there. So first, I ask them, what's your good goal? The goal you'd be completely happy with that you feel like is a no-brainer. And then I ask, what's your great goal? The goal that would be a little bit of a stretch beyond your expectations that you'd be absolutely thrilled with. Now, if the client doesn't know what a reasonable goal is for them and they're not yet sure what their numbers are, like their cost for client, cost per lead, lifetime value of their customer, this is a good time for you to help them create those reasonable expectations and work towards making a blueprint to get them there. All right, we're halfway there. Mistake number five, not letting the client talk. So a good friend of mine signed her first major book deal with a publishing company. As part of the deal, the publishing company was going to provide her with a promo agent to help with the marketing, and she was going to get to choose from the two candidates that they sent her. So she spent a couple of hours on interviews with these two, two candidates. So prospect A was less experienced than prospect B. This person hadn't worked as, as many large book launches and she was newer in the field. Prospect B had worked on tons of big book launches with household names, but she didn't choose prospect B and here's why. Why wouldn't someone choose the more experienced book agent? Well, prospect B barely let my friend get a word in edgewise during their interview. While well, Prospect A chit-chatted, got to know my friend, asked her about her goals. She asked questions and listened to the answers. Prospect B asked very few questions, then answered them all herself while talking over my friend. Now I get it. Sales calls with big names can be intimidating and the temptation is to make sure the client understands your expertise by interjecting it at every opportunity. You do want the client to feel comfortable with your skill level but most people would rather work with someone who listens to them, even if they're not as experienced. An experienced person that they feel doesn't care about their wishes and their campaigns and only wants to talk about themselves? No thanks, right? Do this instead. Ask a question and listen. Let them talk and focus on the information they give. Don't interrupt. And also don't be afraid to just be a person. Like, don't be afraid to chit chat, get to know them a little bit, comment on their dog in the background. Little things like that build trust and rapport and that's always a good thing. Mistake number six is not having work samples ready. So let's just be clear, not every client's gonna ask to see your work samples, but if they do, you wanna be like, yeah, sure, I will send you some over right away instead of, oh, uh, well, let me see what I can find. That just doesn't instill a whole lot of confidence. I probably get asked to see work samples about one every four calls. And what I have is a simple Google slide doc that has screenshots and some stats. Clients love it, and it's quick and easy for me to upload that into Google Drive and just drop a link into my discovery call forms, okay? And you can do that too. Create something simple, upload it into Google Drive, and then have the link handy so that you can drop it or send in an email during that sales call. 
Mistake number seven is being wishy-washy on the next steps. So most of my sales call lasts around 20 to 30 minutes. And by that time, I have a good idea of what the client needs. They feel comfortable moving forward. It's time to say goodbye and go on to the next steps. But don't just say goodbye without communicating clearly about what comes next. This is gonna help you keep the whole sales process in momentum. Create a set follow-up process for yourself and make sure your client knows what comes next. I recommend letting them know while you're still on the sales call that next steps are I'm gonna sit down and create a proposal based on what we talked about today and I'll be sending it over by such and such a date and time. Then deliver it sooner. Set the tone for excellence by under promising and over delivering from the start. So do this. When you send the proposal, let them know what to do with it. If you require a signature, verbal or written acceptance, a project payment or deposit, tell them let them know what the next step is the more clear and straightforward you are the easier it will be for them to give you the yes and start now mistake number eight happens in an instant it's short sweet and simple but so easy to overlook and that is not asking them for their best email so i have been known to send off proposals to the email that automatically came in on my scheduler and then never hearing back it took this happening a couple of times for me to realize what was happening Sometimes the email they use to book the call isn't their regular email. I needed to be asking before we hung up, what's the best email to send a proposal to? That way, not only does it give me the right place to send it, but it gives them that little, you know, light bulb moment. This is where it's going to come. I'm going to keep my eye on that. So be sure you ask where the client would like you to send the proposal. This gets you the information that you need and it helps keep things out of the spam folder because they will be looking for it. And that's a win-win for everyone. Our last mistake, mistake number nine, is not following up. So in a perfect world, you'd send the proposal, they fall in love with it, and sign, pay, and skip off together into the sunset with your new project. Except it's not a perfect world and that doesn't always happen. Sometimes when you send the proposal, you don't hear back immediately or even for days or weeks. Don't just assume that means they don't want to work with you. There's a lot of reasons for this. Maybe their inbox is eating emails. Maybe it has to go through another department. Maybe they're on vacation. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes in their personal or professional life, so follow up. Make sure to follow up 24 to 48 hours after sending the proposal. Your message can be really simple. Hey, I enjoyed chatting with you on your discovery call on Tuesday about your upcoming launch. I hope you received the proposal I sent over on Thursday morning. Let me know if you have any questions or if I can help clarify anything for you. I look forward to getting started. Simple, sweet, and it also serves a purpose of jogging their memory. You, many times you'll get a response like, oh my gosh, thanks for following up. I just found it in my junk mail. Or thanks so much for circling back. Things have been crazy around here, but I'm looking at it today. Follow up, follow up, follow up. Knowing what not to do can be just as important as knowing what to do on sales calls with prospective clients. And now you have nine mistakes to avoid that can help you keep your sales calls on track. So what do you think? Give me a thumbs up if this video is helpful and drop a comment below and let me know which of these tips will become sales call game changers for you. If you missed my last video, I shared four juicy target audience trust building tips. Check out the link below in the video description to watch. And make sure to subscribe and follow this channel for more tips, strategies, and resources for freelance copywriting mamas. I'm Krista, living the mom, wife, copywriter life.